My life was ordinary until a certain point. To me, friendship means being able to trust someone completely, knowing they won't let you down. It's about having someone there when you're in trouble, always ready to help. That's how I define friendship. However, friendship ends when a friend starts eyeing your wife. I go Bitesen, and my profession is in mechanics. My world revolves around cars, especially one, a vintage Mustang my father gave me on my 18th birthday. It's more than just a vehicle, it symbolizes home and my identity. We've been inseparable for three years without a single serious disagreement. During leisure hours, we enjoy strolls in the park, movie nights, and occasional outings with friends, whether it's hitting a club or relaxing at a bar. But there's a catch, our intimate life. I know Helen desires more than I can presently provide. My physically demanding job leaves me drained by evening, often disappointing her. I try not to dwell on the disappointment reflected in her eyes, but it weighs on me. Yet, I understand that without my work, we have nothing to sustain us. My circle of friends is unique. Carlos, a younger college student, is a fitness enthusiast who thrives on attention. Then there's Amber, Helen's high school best friend, and her partner, Fred. While Fred and I aren't particularly close, our girlfriends keep us connected, and he generally doesn't bother me. Everything started with a call from Carlos. He suggested we get away for the weekend to a lake, to a resort where we could swim and relax away from the city bustle. The idea seemed tempting, but I decided to consult with Helen first. Helen came home in the evening, and I wanted to tell her this news, but she found out about this plan before me, which made me wary. Carlos had never called her directly before. Why did he do it this time? Helen was thrilled with the idea and insisted we go. She said it would be a great opportunity to relax together, especially since Fred could drive us in his big old SUV, which could fit five people and a bunch of stuff. In the following days, I couldn't stop thinking about the upcoming trip. Helen had already started planning what we would take with us, and her excitement was infectious. We sat in the kitchen surrounded by maps and guidebooks she had found at the library where she worked. This is going to be great, she said, genuinely smiling. I couldn't disagree with her. Her optimism had always been my support. That evening, as we were having dinner, I noticed Helen was increasingly distracted by her phone. Carlos sent a list of things we need to take, she explained. I nodded, trying to hide my irritation. It's not that I didn't trust Carlos, but his sudden interest in my wife seemed odd to me. Why didn't he write to me? The following day, Helen and I set out for shopping. We needed to buy everything necessary for the trip, mainly bathing suits and food and drinks. Helen was in her element, selecting the best and most comfortable items. But what especially amazed me was her new swimsuit, which was very revealing. I barely managed to restrain myself from getting too close to her right in the changing room. We're only going to be there for a couple of days, Helen, not a month, I joked, watching her carefully pick out items. She just smiled sweetly in response and continued her search. On the way home, we discussed the trip plan. Fred agreed to take us in his SUV, which was a big plus. Everything will be perfect, she said, holding my hand. I hoped she was right. The day before the trip, we packed all our stuff and loaded it into the car. Carlos and Fred came to us quite early to avoid the morning traffic jams. Amber, in turn, was already waiting for us in the car, eager to start our little adventure. While we were driving, Helen was constantly chatting with Amber and the guys, and I felt a bit left out. Not that I minded, I was just absorbed in my thoughts. It seemed to me that I'd forgotten something important, left something significant unsaid. But looking at Helen, happy and carefree, made those thoughts recede. When we arrived at the destination, I was struck by the beauty of the surrounding nature. The recreation base turned out to be a real secluded paradise. The cabin we got was on the shore of a lake, and the view offered a magnificent view of the mountains. How do you like it? 
Helen asked, hugging me by the waist. It's wonderful, I replied, and at that moment, I truly thought so. We spent the rest of the day at the lake, swimming and enjoying the sun. In the evening, sitting by the fire, I looked at Helen and thought about how much this person means to me. All my doubts and fears seemed so distant and unimportant. But the night brought restlessness with it. Helen was tossing and turning in bed, and I pretended to be asleep, watching her. When she got up and left the room, I thought she was just going to the bathroom, so I lay there waiting. It felt like about thirty minutes had passed when Helen returned to bed. What happened, dear? I asked. Oh, I see you're not asleep. I just went to the bathroom. Probably shouldn't have eaten that cheese, she said, and that reassured me. Eventually, we fell asleep in each other's arms. Waking up early in the morning, the first thing I felt was the cold, fresh air seeping through the slightly open window. I turned to Helen. She was sleeping peacefully, tranquility evident on her face. I decided not to wake her and went out to the balcony. The view from there was truly mesmerizing. Mountains wrapped in morning mist gently rose above the calm surface of the lake. I breathed in the cool air, trying to shake off the remnants of the night's anxiety. The day promised to be eventful. When everyone woke up, we gathered in the kitchen for breakfast. Helen was full of energy and suggested spending the day at the lake. Her enthusiasm quickly spread to the rest of us, and we happily agreed. Amber and Fred were already ready for new adventures, and Carlos seemed eager to finally get on the water. Carlos, as usual, was shirtless, showing off his toned arms and abs to everyone. After breakfast, we headed to the lake. I noticed Helen and Carlos whispering together, but decided not to make anything of it. Maybe they were just discussing the details of our day on the water. I didn't want to spoil the mood for myself or anyone else over trifles. The lake was incredibly beautiful. The water was so clear that you could see every stone at the bottom. We rented a boat and set out to swim. We wanted to reach the very center of the lake and jump into the water from the sides. The sun was shining brightly, and a light breeze brought coolness. Helen was laughing and joking, and I couldn't take my eyes off her. In those moments, I forgot about everything in the world. The sun reflected off her smooth and tender body. I thought, if I didn't have sunglasses, I would be blinded. We jumped into the water, swam, and enjoyed every minute. Helen was happy, and seeing her like that was all I needed. At some point, I thought that all my doubts and worries had been in vain. Returning home in the evening, we decided to have a barbecue. Carlos took on the role of head chef while Fred and I handled the preparation. Amber and Helen decorated the tables and prepared the snacks. Everything was going perfectly, and I felt like I was part of something bigger, something important. But when night fell and everyone began to retreat to their own rooms, my unease returned. Helen was acting oddly again, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something was going on between her and Carlos. I went to bed, but due to my severe fatigue and sunburn, my eyes quickly closed, and I fell asleep. I don't remember if Helen was asleep at that moment, but I hoped she hadn't gone anywhere. The next morning came too soon. My eyes opened even before the first rays of the sun pierced through the curtains. The night was restless, and I frequently woke up, listening to the silence occasionally broken only by the sound of the lake. Helen seemed calm, but her unusual behavior from the previous night still troubled me. After breakfast, which was in a light and relaxed atmosphere, I noticed Helen frequently exchanging glances with Carlos. I wanted to think I was exaggerating, but those small moments made me doubt. We decided to go for a walk in the forest surrounding our retreat. The forest was dense and cool, filled with the sounds of nature. Amber and Fred walked ahead, chatting cheerily, while Helen and I followed with Carlos. It seemed to me there was some invisible attraction between them. That I couldn't ignore. On the way back to the house, Helen took my hand and smiled as if trying to assure me that everything was fine. 
I responded with a smile, trying to dispel my anxious thoughts. In the evenings, we arranged an outdoor movie screening. Fred found an old projector, and we settled on the grass with popcorn and blankets. Everything seemed perfect, but I still felt tension in the air. After the movie, when everyone started heading off to sleep, Helen said she would go for a walk. I need some fresh air, she explained. I offered to go with her, but she insisted on being alone. Her words sounded convincing, but I couldn't shake off a feeling of anxiety. Lying in bed and listening to the house absorb the night silence, I couldn't fall asleep. Thoughts of Helen, her strange nocturnal wanderings, and the exchanged glances with Carlos kept me awake. I decided I had to figure this out as soon as she returned. When Helen came back an hour later, she tried to be quiet, but I was already sitting up in bed waiting. Is everything all right? I asked, trying to hide the concern in my voice. She nodded. All's well. I was just sitting by the lake. Today was such a busy day, my head spinning. Her words didn't sound convincing to me, but I invited her to bed, and out of decency, attempted to be intimate with her. Let's not right now. It's late, and I'm not feeling well, Helen said, and that upset me. I turned away from her and lay down to sleep. Twenty minutes later, I felt Helen trying to wake me up. Are you asleep? She said, but I decided not to respond. She repeated the same thing about ten minutes later, but again, I didn't answer. Then she got up and went out the door, and I heard footsteps down the staircase. The house was two-storied, on the second floor, there were two rooms, one for us with Helen, the other for Amber and Fred, while Carlos slept downstairs on a soft fold-out couch. After lying in bed for about fifteen minutes, I decided to leave my room and check where Helen had been disappearing to for so long. Carefully opening the door, I found myself in the corridor. On my hunches, I started crawling towards the staircase to listen to what was happening downstairs. Through the silence, I heard Helen's faint moans, as if something was covering her mouth. Then, I started carefully descending the stairs and got a full view. As I descended the stairs, wanting to remain unnoticed, I took my phone with me, having dimmed its brightness to the minimum beforehand. I extended the phone downwards, wanting to take a quick photo, and pressing the button, I realized I had forgotten to turn off the flash, which exposed my presence. The room was dark, but moonlight streaming through the window illuminated their silhouettes. They turned around towards me like guilty children caught stealing cookies. The world around ceased to exist. I went down even further. All I saw were Helen and Carlos, Helen sitting on Carlos, covered only by a thin blanket. I couldn't utter a word, my breathing quickened, and I felt anger filling every cell of my body. Carlos tried to say something, throwing Helen off him and moving towards me, raising his hands in a gesture of peace, but that only fueled my rage. I didn't listen to them. When he came too close to me, I reflexively struck him in the face, causing him to fall to the ground. Helen started to cry, whispering my name, but her tears felt like drops of acid, only intensifying my pain. I took a step back, trying to gather my thoughts. Everything inside me screamed in pain and betrayal. My wife, my love, was with another, my friend. I felt the world I had built around us crumbling before my eyes. How could you? I said. I didn't mean to. I'm sorry. It's just that we haven't had sex in so long, and Carlos was so manly and handsome, she said. Do you realize what you are telling your husband? He's handsome? Are you aware that he only got that physique thanks to pills? I said. I'm sorry, 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 she said, trying to stand up and come towards me. Don't come any closer to me. I see you didn't even use protection, right? I asked. I'm guilty, forgive me, she said. And you probably weren't aware that Carlos has a venereal disease, right? I asked. 
Carlos indeed had a disease known only to me. He shared this with me a year and a half ago, and I kept this information secret. But, if I had known he would want my wife, of course I would have warned Helen about it in advance. Wait, are you joking? She began, with fear in her eyes. No, dear. You are in deep trouble now. Answer me one question. How long ago was your first time? Be honest. I asked the very first day we got here, she said. Well, at least that's something good, I said. Helen was sobbing, and I didn't even notice that Amber and Fred had come down due to the noise and were witnessing the whole scene. Sit on the bed, do you understand? I told Helen and threw the wedding ring at her. It hit her on the forehead and she screamed, ow. I started heading for the exit. I needed to get outside. I stepped outside, took a deep breath of the night air. The sky was strung with stars, but their light seemed cold and lifeless to me. That night, I lost everything I loved. A void pulsed in my chest, leaving behind only a shadow of who I used to be. I heard noise from a house and saw that Carlos had woken up, stood up, and started yelling at Fred. At that moment, I saw Fred hit Carlos again and he fell to the floor. I smirked seeing this. I began to laugh hysterically. Fred came out to me and suggested we sit at the kitchen table to discuss everything, and I followed him. We sat down at the kitchen table and I told them everything I had learned. They listened to me attentively without interrupting, allowing me to vent everything that had built up inside. At that moment, Helen was sitting on the couch, crying. She tried to say something, but each time I told her, be quiet. What are you going to do? Fred asked when I finished. I shook my head. All my plans, dreams of the future with Helen, had shattered in an instant. I don't know, was all I could manage to say. Amber took my hands. We're with you, C.E.N. Whatever you decide to do, we'll support you. No one could have imagined this happening. Her words were like balm to my wounds. At that moment, I realized that despite all the pain, I was not alone. I knew we couldn't delay and had to teach them a lesson, at least. Amber and Fred went upstairs to pack their things, while I looked after Carlos, who was alive, and that made me happy. Helen watched from the couch as Fred and Amber brought down bags of belongings. Are you leaving? she asked. Yes, but there's only room for three in a car. You and Carlos will have to make your own way, I suggested. It took us five hours by car to get here. How do you expect us to get back to the city, she said indignantly. It wasn't hard for you to sneak down the stairs every night, so what's the problem getting to the city with your macho? I asked. Does this mean it's over between us, she asked. No, I just arranged all this for fun, I said sarcastically. Honey, stop. We'll make up. It was a misunderstanding. You yourself said that making mistakes is useful, she said. Firstly, I'm not your honey anymore, and secondly, I don't want to talk to you, I said. At that moment, Fred brought down the last bag, and we went outside, locking the door behind us, leaving Helen and Carlos alone, locked in the house surrounded by the forest. We loaded the stuff into the SUV and got in the car. Amber asked if it wasn't too cruel to leave them there alone. They'll stay here alone, not only locked in the house, but also needing to pay the remaining amount for the house and they have no money, Fred laughed. We had only paid half for the house, the next half was due upon departure. And I had left Helen without any money. Moreover, the signal was bad here and there was no internet, but they would still be found since the lake house owners were supposed to return tomorrow. We were driving and decided to discuss my next steps. I determined that the first order of business would be to consult a lawyer and start the divorce process. Amber offered her help, mentioning that she knew a good specialist who could assist me. Fred added that it was also important to take care of my emotional state and offered several contacts of professional psychologists. 
I declined the psychologist but took down the lawyer's contact. Upon returning home in the morning, I immediately prepared the documents, attaching a photo taken last night. Since the photo was taken with a flash, everything was clearly visible. I also blocked our joint electronic accounts to prevent Helen from accessing the funds. I changed the locks on the house and installed an alarm system, just in case. I also began gathering Helen's belongings and found a pack of condoms we never used and $15,000 in cash in her winter jacket. I was tempted to take the money but decided to leave it in the jacket and tossed it into her bag, not wanting to take anything from a despicable person. Throughout the day, I gathered all of Helen's things and left them outside the door. The porch was cluttered with her belongings. I didn't care. If someone came and stole her things, that was not my problem. What comforted me was that the house was entirely mine, gifted by my parents before my marriage to Helen, so she couldn't claim it. Four days later, Helen returned to town with Carlos, and they headed straight for my house. I was at work at the time and received a notification that someone was trying to break into my house, with security forces arriving within minutes. I laughed out loud when I went to the police station in the evening and saw the two of them sitting in a cell. At the police station, I confirmed that Helen was my wife, but a court case was pending and she would soon be my ex. When the security arrived at my house, they saw a man with a bat and a woman trying to break in. They were caught and jailed for a few days, and now Carlos had to buy me a new window. At the police station, I made it clear to him to stay away from me. A month later, the first court session took place. The divorce process was complex and emotionally draining. Helen tried to contact me several times, but I realized that for our mutual good, we needed to give each other space. Meetings with the lawyer and the police took a lot of energy. I got tested for sexually transmitted diseases and fortunately tested negative, unlike Helen who tested positive, putting Carlos at risk of jail time for engaging in unprotected intimacy, especially since he regularly missed taking his medication. But I didn't care about that. What mattered most was that I was healthy. The hardest part was realizing that life without Helen would be completely different. We had spent so much time together that her absence felt like a missing piece of me. But with each passing day, I learned to accept this, focusing on building a new life. Amber and Fred became my pillars during this difficult period. They were always there when times were tough, helping me look forward. Their friendship reminded me that despite all losses, there are still people who love and support me. Gradually, I began to find solace in the little things, evening walks, reading books I had long wanted to read, and even work, which helped me distract myself. I started to rediscover the pleasure of solitude, finding in it not only sadness, but also an opportunity for self-development. One day, sitting by the river and watching the sunset, I realized that despite all the pain and loss, new horizons were unfolding before me. Life after Helen would be different, but that didn't mean it would be worse. I began to feel ready to meet it with an open heart, ready for new challenges and opportunities it would bring. With each new day, I began to feel a bit different. I wouldn't say it was easier, that's not the right term. Rather, I became more focused, finding in myself the strength to look into the future without fear and regret. Amber and Fred continued to support me, and their friendship was the anchor that kept me from sinking into despair. My morning walks became a kind of ritual. I walked along the riverbank contemplating what I wanted to change in my life. I realized that I wanted to spend more time on myself, my hobbies, and interests that had been forgotten. One day, sitting in a cafe and sipping coffee, I felt truly calm for the first time after everything that had happened. I opened a notebook and began to list all the things I had always wanted to do but had postponed. The list was long, from trips I wanted to take to skills I wanted to learn. I suddenly realized that the world around me remained full of opportunities, even if one chapter of my life had been turned. Returning to work was another step forward. 
I discovered that my passion for cars had not faded. On the contrary, I began to invest even more enthusiasm in it, seeing it not just as a job, but as a way of self-expression. My old Mustang, which seemed to me a reminder of the past, now filled me with a sense of pride and achievement. The most difficult part was learning to trust people again. Meeting new people, interacting with colleagues wasn't always easy, but I gradually learned to open up to the world, understanding that not all stories end like mine with Helen. Helen herself is to blame for getting infected and now lives in some tiny room in another state. Her life is not turning out well. She didn't finish college and quit her job. Her affair brought her nothing, and she's to blame for that. The person I once considered a friend is in prison, and it's his fault too. I did nothing wrong to these people. They chose their path, and I just helped them end up where they should be. The main thing is to keep your sanity and believe in the best. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing. If you haven't already, feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care. My name is Tom J, and my wife is Linda. I'm only 5 feet 10 inches and 165 pounds, but I have my strengths. We met in college when I was 23 and she was 21. I served in the army while taking classes to earn a double degree in economics and accounting. She majored in biology. My army service did not require constant prisons and hotspots, but it was dangerous. Our unit was assigned to carry out individual missions, often involving the punishment of someone who wanted to appear as a friend. In short, we were killers. My specialty was planning and close combat. I graduated at age 25, and two years later, I left the army and married Linda. In four years, we had two girls. I worked from home handling the accounting for some local businesses and also did some sales from home. Linda was busy with the children, but when our marriage was 10 years old, she took a job in a local laboratory associated with the college. Both girls were in school, and I was working from home so she could return to a job she enjoyed. We lived in a house where I grew up. I've owned it since my parents moved to Florida. I bought it from them when I was in college. Some of our army missions gave the unit a chance to get a good reward, which we divided into 10 parts, so I had the money to buy what was needed. One day at the end of February, we decided to go out with our neighbor friends for dinner and dance at a club afterward. There were eight of us, and we all had babysitters for the kids overnight. Linda and I booked a room at a hotel associated with a dance club. She looked striking at five feet six inches, a slender brunette wearing a blue silk dress. We had a great dinner and were having a lot of fun dancing in the club when a group of six people showed up. One of them was a large, fair-haired guy, Mark Stevens, a professional midfielder for the local team. All the women at our table immediately noticed him. Stevens was with a charming blonde who had what looked like a large wedding ring on her finger. They danced together. Our friend June said she was a cheerleader for the team and engaged to Stevens. After they had been there for a while, I noticed Stevens looking at our table. He stood up and walked towards us. He immediately turned to Linda and simply asked her to dance, without even looking at me. I put my hand on her shoulder to stop her, but she got up from the table and went with him. She didn't even look back at me. I was more than a little annoyed. I was even more annoyed when, after two fast dances, it was time for a slow one and Linda melted into Mark's arms. I stood up and walked to the bar, right past them. The women at our table didn't like this, and they made that clear, but I went anyway. Not that it mattered much to Linda, who didn't notice me passing by at all. I had coffee. When the slow number ended, they parted and Linda returned to our table. I stayed at the bar and drank my coffee. I saw her look around for me and saw me there. She looked a little worried. She sat down next to June. I walked over, and as I got closer, they both stood up. Did you have fun? Sorry, maybe I got a little carried away, I said. 
Maybe so, June chimed in. Tom, it was just a little dance, nothing special, June said. I thought it was insulting to me, I said. I sat down. June and I are going to the ladies' room. We'll be right back, Linda said. They left, and Mark left through the front door without the blonde. June returned, but Linda was not with her. Where is she, Tom? Linda is not here now. She left with Mark, June said. Are you kidding? I ran outside and saw Linda getting into the red Escalade. The car started moving. I returned to the table. June was talking to the others at the table. Did you all know what she was doing? June said. Tom, you have to let her spend the night. She will return to you tomorrow, one said. No, I don't want her to come back. Let her know this when you talk to her. We're finished, I said. When I said this, there was a general uproar at the table. They all thought I was too harsh. So, I barked at them, I don't want anything to do with any of you anymore. You all knew and no one warned me, so maybe I could have stopped her. Now she will lose everything for a night. I went to the front desk but saw a blonde woman at a table with the other four who had come with Stevens. Are you his girlfriend? I asked. Yes, I was his girlfriend, but not now. Where did they go? She asked. To our house on Cherry Lane. He said he would never do it once we were engaged. Excuse me, was that your wife? Was the key word here, I said. He'll finish with her in the morning and take her home. He likes to gloat over his husband. What an idiot. At this... Two other guys, both big, one black and the other white, were offended. I ignored them. I gave my business card to May and asked her to call me. She smiled but cried. I walked away. I took my coat but left Linda's. I went to the hotel room and took my suitcase but left Linda. I checked out. As I drove home, a plan formed in my head. This has happened to me before when I was in the military, that's why I'm still alive. I wish I had come up with a plan before Linda left. I drove into the garage, went inside, and turned on the security system. I went to the basement and took out the rope that I had kept for many years. Then I went upstairs, took off my clothes, and jogged to the second floor. I put on black underwear, a black hoodie, dark gray sweatpants, old sneakers, and two pairs of gloves. I also took a balaclava. I put it all on and went up to the attic with the rope. I secured it to the beam securely, just as I did as a child. I climbed out of the narrow window and jumped down the wall of the house. On the other side, there was nothing but forest. I ran and jumped over the side fence, down the path to the workshop located there. I went inside and grabbed a backpack, a few extra wool socks, a pocket knife, and an old hand axe that I had deep in my toolbox. I put it all in my backpack. Then I took my bike and rode, pedaling towards the river through a small forest. I crossed the bridge over the river and headed towards Cherry Lane. I saw a house with a statue of a football player and a red Escalade parked in front of it. I took an axe and a knife, jumped over the fence, and ran past the SUV. I used the axe to break the passenger side window. The alarm sounded. Then I jumped out onto the porch and hid behind a column near the door. I didn't have to wait long. The light came on and the door opened. The idiot stuck his head out and used the key fob to disable the alarm. He went outside. He had a semi-automatic pistol. I hit him on the head with an axe as he passed me. He fell and crawled. I delivered one powerful strike with the axe with both hands. I returned, closed the front door, and ran away. I jumped over the stone wall and returned to my bike. I put on wool socks, put the axe, knife, gloves, and shoes in the backpack, and zipped it up. I jumped into the saddle and flew to the river. When I arrived at the bridge, I stopped and threw the entire backpack as far as possible into the river. It had rained the day before, and the current was fast. 
I rode my bike back in the direction of the house, through the nearby forest, to the workshop. I went inside. I took off my socks and put on another pair of sneakers. I sprayed the bike's handles and pedals with an ammonia solution and wiped them off. Then I ran back, jumped over the side fence, and climbed up the side of the house again. It was not as easy as I thought, but I managed and climbed through the small window. I pulled the rope and coiled it. I wiped the window sill with a rag and ran with the rope to the basement. I took off all my clothes, including my mask and gloves, and put them in the washing machine. Then I showered in the basement bathroom for a while, washing everything twice. Once that was done, I put on my gym shorts and headed upstairs. I left the basement door open so I could hear when the washing machine stopped. I put on the clothes I wore to the club the night before. I went down to the basement and put the wet clothes in the dryer. I went upstairs, prepared snacks, and drank a glass of whiskey. Then I sat for a while, thinking things through again. When the dryer stopped, I took the clothes upstairs and put everything back in its place. The balaclava went to the back of the closet where I always kept it. I looked at my watch. It was 2.50 a.m. All this, starting from the moment I entered the house after returning from the club, began at midnight. I went downstairs, sat on the sofa, and drank more whiskey. I fell asleep. I was woken up by the doorbell at 6.20 a.m. I looked at the door camera display and saw two people, an African-American woman and a white guy with short hair cups. The doorbell rang again, and I opened it. Who are you? You look like a policeman, I said. I'm Detective Asper, and this is Detective Logan, said the black woman. They flashed their badges. I made an uncertain face. Is this about Linda? Did he hurt her? I asked. No, she was not physically harmed, but Mr. Stevens was attacked. Can we go inside? Detective Asper asked. Certainly. I replied. Where is Linda? Did you bring her with you? No, sir. She is in the hospital being treated for shock, Detective Logan answered. I paused for a second. I just looked at them, and they just looked at me. Have a seat, I said, pointing to the sofa. But they were sitting separately on two chairs with straight backs, so I used the sofa. I think you should explain what happened, I said. What have you been doing since your wife left the club with Stevens? It was Logan again. Just tell me what happened, Asper replied. No, you just have to answer the question, I said. I went to our hotel room, picked up my things, checked out, and came here. I drank myself to sleep on this sofa. You woke me up. Is there anyone else here? I asked. No. The children are staying with the nanny for the night, I replied. Did you make any calls, write to someone you know to prove that you were here? Asper asked. No, but I never left, I replied. Asper looked around. I see you have a security system. What does? It includes, it covers all the doors. I think I can prove to you that I was here. Let me go upstairs. I suggested. They followed me into the upstairs office, and I sat down at the computer desk. I showed them the system, and they watched me upload data from 6 p.m. until they arrived. I gave them a quick look. The system was targeted to all three doors, the front, side, and sliding patio door leading to the pool. The side I went down had no door, looked out onto the woods, and had two large windows, neither of which opened, so there was no surveillance there. We'll have to take this computer, Logan said. Why? Because you could have ruined it before we got here, he explained. Okay, but I can't give it away for more than one day. This is a work computer, and I need it. I have a replacement, but it won't last long. Look at me. I'm going to download some stuff onto this external drive, including what I just gave you, I said as I did it. 
They wanted to look around, and I let them, but insisted that they stick together and be with me. They took a few pictures and then left. It was 7.10 a.m. I called Linda's parents, John and Stephanie. They lived next door, but were at their house by the lake at that moment. I told them what happened, and the police said Linda was in shock at the hospital. John was simply stunned by what Linda did, while Stephanie might not have been all that surprised. Are you going to see her? Stephanie asked. No, sorry. That's why I called you. I really don't want anything to do with her after what she did. It's bad that the guy was attacked, but it's not my fault. Apparently, he's done this kind of thing many times. When she gets out of the hospital, she needs to stay away from me and the house. We can arrange to have her things moved, I explained. Why don't you move, and she can stay? The children have lived there all their lives, John suggested. This is my home. This is not community property acquired during marriage, I asserted. John was a lawyer, and I assumed he would try to work something out. You just had to wait, he said. That's pretty cruel, Tom, Stephanie added. Not as cruel as what she did to me, I replied. The conversation ended there. Then I called my parents in Florida. I told them as best I could what happened. They were also shocked by Linda's behavior. My dad turned on the TV and told me there was news about Stevens. They said that he was attacked and killed in his home. This is not news to me, I thought. The phone rang. It was a landline. It was Judy. Tom, where is Linda? We heard that Mark was killed, she asked. She's in shock in the hospital, as the police told me. You saw her? I replied. Which hospital is she in, she inquired. I don't know, and I don't plan to date her. Do not be like that. She needs your support, Judy said. She will never get any support from me. I don't care if her big night was ruined, if it was ruined, I retorted. Judy hung up. I showered again and got dressed to go pick up the kids from the babysitter. It was around 8.20 when I got there. I discovered that they had not heard anything about the evening's events. We went home, and they wanted to know where Linda was. I don't think she'll be here today. She has something she must do. We'll just spend the day without her. Dress for football, I said. I took them to the soccer complex where they had games at noon and 1.30. I was pretty relaxed watching them play. Michelle, the youngest, was quite nice. Laura, not so much, but she tried really hard, and it was good exercise for them. After the games were over, we bought ice cream and went home. There were several messages on my mobile phone. I had the sound on mute while I was hanging out with the girls. One was from Linda's parents, telling me that she was at St. Jude's and was unresponsive. One was from a doctor at the hospital asking me to call. One was from Judy. She told me that Linda was at the police station and wasn't talking to anyone. She said I should probably cool off and bring the girls to her. I told the girls that their mom was in the hospital and that she was unharmed but emotionally traumatized by something that happened the night before. They wanted to know what happened. I told them, your mother went with a famous football player to his house last night to have intimacy. There's no other way to say it. I thought about hiding it from you, but I decided that you would find out. While she was there, someone attacked the football player, but apparently not her. But she must have found him or something because she's in the hospital in shock. They weren't sure if they wanted to go to her, but I told them to get dressed, and we went. I called the doctor back, Laura Thompson. She said Linda was traumatized and was currently in a catatonic state. I asked her about bringing the kids. She hesitated. Are you going to visit her? I really don't want to see her at all. I assume you know why. But I can bring the girls if you think it might help. Do they know what happened? 
I mean, about the surrounding circumstances. You mean intimate between Linda and the football player? Yes, I told them. They are dressed and ready to go if you think it might help Linda, I explained. Okay, meet me in room 31 in 30 minutes, she said. We went there. Dr. Thompson was in her late 40s, the psychiatrist. We talked for a while, and then she turned to the girls. She said their mother was in complete shock and seemed unaware of her surroundings. She said meeting the girls might help. Did they want to see her? They did, I said. Just that. I walked them to the door and looked inside. Linda sat on the bed staring at the TV with cartoons. The girls hesitantly approached her. Laura, the eldest, touched her hand and called her mom. Shelly followed her, but there was no reaction. Shelly began to cry. I walked up to her, took her in my arms, and looked at Linda. Nothing. I took Laura's hand and led them to the exit. Well, we tried, I said. Will she wake up? Laura asked. Of course, someday, I said. Maybe you can visit her again soon. Maybe when she comes to her senses, you'll be able to see her. What if she doesn't wake up? Shelley whispered. I reassured her, she will wake up, I know it. Maybe not soon, the doctor said. Girls, I'll definitely let you know when she comes to her senses. After this, we left the hospital. Both girls were crying in the car. Maybe I shouldn't have taken them, but I just wanted to see Linda and see if their presence would help. Despite my rude reaction to her cheating, I didn't wish it on her. I felt bad about it, even though she deserved to suffer, but not like it is now. I felt tears running down my cheeks. When we got home, I made them scrambled eggs and toast. I deliberately involved them in cooking, pretending that I needed help. It seemed that the opportunity to command me encouraged them. Then I turned on the movie for them. I went into my office and called my friend to see if I could get any information about what happened at the Stevens house after I left. He was a public defender and good at his job. He said I wouldn't be able to get police reports, but he had an idea. Ambulance mileage reports were publicly available. I asked him to send me any information he could, and we hung up. An hour later, my lawyer friend called back. He said he emailed me information about the ambulance being called. I told him about the police visit. He said that if the security system showed that no one had come or gone, I probably wouldn't have anything to worry about. But he also said that the police might get a search warrant or might want to talk to me again. He recommended a lawyer if needed. After I saw the report, police found Linda with Stephen's head in her lap. She was covered in blood, wearing only a thin robe. She repeated, no, 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 over and over again. The police picked her up and put her in the ambulance. She was unresponsive when the ambulance arrived and all the way to the hospital. An officer rode with her, asking if she saw who did it but he didn't receive any answer. It made me sick, and it made me wonder if she would ever recover. I looked up PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. I've already looked it up before, for myself. I have studied the shock-induced catatonic state. It seemed that people usually recovered from a catatonic state, but could suffer from PTSD for years. The lawyer, Joan Drake, made an appointment for me on Monday morning at 9.30. She gave me her mobile number in case the police arrived early. They didn't. On Sunday, the girls and I goofed around as I tried to convince them that Linda would return eventually but would still need our help. For me, I wondered what her reaction to me might be when she had it. I was pretty sure she didn't see anything, and if she really saw something, it would only be a man in all black and a mask. But maybe she will assume that I did it. I did not know. On Monday, I took the girls to school. I followed local news coverage of Stephen's murder. Linda's name was not mentioned, 
but it was said Stevens was entertaining a married woman when he was attacked outside his home. A neighbor called the police in response to Linda's screams. Until now, no one other than the authorities had linked Linda or me to the murder, but I assumed that this would change over time. Joan Drake was a graceful blonde of about 45. She was also quite edgy, just like my friend said. I told her the story from the beginning and gave her a copy of the ambulance report. She was shocked. She stared at me. I looked back at her and simply said that the police had a copy of the CCTV footage and that it had not been tampered with. It showed absolutely no one coming in or out between the time I got home and the time the police came. I asked her to return my computer because I needed it for work. I gave her the advance and listened as she called the police station and asked for Detective Asper. Hello, Detective, she said. This is Joan Drake. I'm calling about Tom Jot. I want to know if I can return his work computer. No, I think you had enough time to see if there were any changes. You know there weren't any. Okay, I'll send someone tomorrow morning to pick it up from you. No, I'll send someone from the office. He won't come. I raised my hand. I mouthed, I'll come. She nodded. Okay, he'll be there at nine o'clock. When she hung up, I told her that I would not talk to the cops and that I would have my phone with me to record conversations if there were any. I left that afternoon. The girls returned home from school and immediately asked about Linda. I already called the doctor, and no significant changes have occurred, I said. They went about their homework. Later, we got pizza delivered. I told them that if their mother didn't come home soon, I would have to learn to cook, I added. This caused laughter. I'm actually a good cook, just never made it at home. When her sister came upstairs, Laura asked me, Can you forgive mom for having intimate relations with another guy? Maybe, I said. I really don't know right now. I just want her to feel better. Then the landline phone rang. It was Jim Beeman from the newspaper. Mr. J, this is Jim Beeman from the Tribune. Hello, I said. We have information that it was your wife, Linda, who was with Mark Stevens when he was killed. Can you confirm this? I wouldn't want this to become public knowledge. My two kids are in school, and they might get in trouble if this comes up. So, you confirm it? How do you feel about the death of your wife's lover? I understand what you're getting at. If anything you publish causes any harm to my family, I will act against you and your newspaper. It will come out, Mr. J. There's nothing I can do about it. I looked out the window and saw a TV truck parked in front of the house. Channel 7, I said. I see a TV truck. I think you're right. Crap, I'm sorry. I have to go. There was a knock on the door. I looked into the camera and saw a young woman with a microphone. I spoke over the intercom. Get out. You're trespassing on someone else's territory, and I'll call the police. Is your wife there, Mr. Jot? I called the local department and told them I needed help removing the press from my porch. They did respond and removed what was already a group of six people from the porch, but they didn't go far. There were now four trucks there. I called the doctor and told her to make sure Linda was safe before the press came. I talked to the girls and told them that I thought they could stay somewhere else with me in homeschool, but they said they wanted to continue going to school, even if they had to live elsewhere. I said I'd think about it. I called my lawyer, Joan, and asked her for advice. She said she would make a statement to the press if I wanted to see if that would calm the tension. We arranged it. The statement was made through her office and stated that my family would like for her to be allowed to continue her normal daily life. It said that I do not comment on rumors about my wife and will not comment on them in the future. It stated that continued media presence outside the home would result in legal action if it harmed the family and that we would appreciate it if the trucks left. Meanwhile, Detective Asper and her boss announced a press conference at 7 p.m. I was watching, 
Police said Mark Stevens was attacked outside his home and killed with a sharp object. It said that although a woman was in the house at the time, there was no indication she witnessed the attack. It said the investigation was ongoing. The first question was whether the woman was married and whether her husband was a suspect. Detective Asper said, since you all know her name, I assume you know that she is married, but we have carried out a thorough investigation into him, and there is no indication that he was involved in the attack. In fact, he appears to have spent the entire night at his home, some distance from the scene of the incident. The reporter spoke, what about other married women, their husbands? We thoroughly investigated allegations that Mr. Stevens regularly seduced married women and found that there was some truth to this. In fact, he appears to have seduced several married women in the presence of their husbands, so we explored this aspect. Chief Johnson interrupted the meeting, that's all for now. If we have anything more before our briefing on Wednesday, we will let you know. The police left amidst screams. I've made arrangements with the girls' school to have their assignments delivered here or sent by computer over the next few days. I called Linda's parents and told them to beware of the press, but no one had shown up yet. They also disappeared from our street on Tuesday. The doctor called and said Linda was starting to respond and that the police were with her. I told her parents and then I gathered the girls to take them to the hospital. By the time we got there, the police were already leaving. Detective Asper said she would like to speak with me after my meeting with Linda. I agreed. Linda still seemed stunned. She greeted the girls with a smile and hugged them, but she didn't look at me. The girls told her about TV trucks in school, but then Linda seemed to doze off, and the doctor said we should let her sleep. Her parents were outside talking to the girls when I went to see Detective Asper. She looks like she's getting better, Asper said. Maybe, I don't know, really. Are you going to take her home until she gets better? I asked. And then? I'm sure we'll separate, Asper said. I think you should give her a break. What other punishment could she receive besides what happened? I questioned. It's not about punishment, it's a matter of respect and trust. I will never trust her, and I will never respect her. Maybe she will never respect me either, I stated. Asper smiled. She may be afraid of you. She may not trust you either. You're just trying to lure me into a trap. You know full well that I had nothing to do with the attack on Stevens. I know that you have an army background. I know you had an impressive reputation in the service. So maybe some average guy couldn't do it, but maybe you could. I didn't do it. You know we have home security video from Stephen's house. It's not my problem. I was not there. See you later. It sounded like a threat. Over the next few days, Linda gradually regained some semblance of normal behavior. I dropped off the girls every day but didn't spend much time in the room with them. On the fourth day, Linda was scheduled to be discharged. She asked to speak to me alone, and I sent the girls away. Forgive me for what I did, putting you in such an awkward position, she said. I don't think apologizing will help, Linda. I can't tell you how humiliating this was for me. Now it's on national news. I'd like to go home when I'm discharged this afternoon. She sat down on the bed and moved towards the chair. Can I go home? You know the media is there, and they will follow you from here. I don't want the girls' lives to be ruined anymore. Maybe I can sneak away now, she said, not looking up. I'll contact security. I can't say I want to be close to you, but maybe I don't have much choice right now. I didn't want you to get hurt. I thought you loved me and could get through this. Or in fact, I didn't think about it at all. Did you have him? No. We were without clothes in bed when the commotion began. I looked at her closely and realized that she was lying. You see, I can't say that I believe you. Or would believe everything you tell me. 
In fact, I can never trust you again. But we can see how things go, okay? I love you, she said. I just turned around and walked out. I went to the hospital security office and arranged for a car to pick Linda up behind the building and take her to my home. It was scheduled for 4 p.m. Everything went without a hitch, and she got home around 4.45. The children and her parents were there with me. I made a bed for myself in my office. Linda will sleep in our room. The rest of the day was very awkward, to say the least. Her parents did not quite understand how to behave in this situation. Linda, her mom, and the kids were playing Monopoly in the living room. Her father wanted to talk, so we went to the patio. What are you going to do, Tom? John asked. I really don't know. But there's a good chance we're finished. You must try to forgive. You have loved each other for so long, and you have a wonderful family. I know. But I wonder if we've really loved each other for so long. If she loved me, she would never have done this. She said they didn't have intercourse, I said. So how should I know? They were there together for quite a long time. Well, it might have made a difference if he hadn't used protection. She may have an illness or be pregnant, Dan. I didn't like this thought. She can stay here for now, but you may soon want to look for some other solution. We returned to the house and all ate pizza together. Her parents went home. As far as I know, they didn't discuss Mark with her. As we were putting the girls to bed, Laura asked Linda why she went to have a night with Mark. I am so sorry. I was wrong and I made a mistake. But I do not understand. He's just a football player. I saw him. He's not our dad. No, not dad. I'll talk to you about him later when I find out more. The girls went to bed and Linda went down to the kitchen. I followed her about ten minutes later. In the meantime, I called my friend, a public defender, and asked him about the autopsy report. He said it was also a public document, and I asked him to get it. Linda drank Pepsi. Alcohol was not recommended for her because it could lead to relapse. Are you sleeping in our room? She asked. No, in the office. Well, you're welcome any time. We'll just have to see right now. I don't see a path forward for us, but this all happened just this week. I can be patient, really. I did not notice. I went up to my office and went to bed. I didn't sleep very well and got up at 5 a.m. I made coffee. A friend of mine sent me a copy of Stephen's office autopsy. I read it carefully, paying particular attention to the trauma analysis. The samples were sent for laboratory analysis. It looked like Linda was lying when she said they didn't have intercourse. I never believed it because of the timing. She was there for approximately two hours before the murder. When she came down, I took the girls to school, almost as usual. However, they were a little depressed. I spent a lot of time considering my options. If it weren't for Linda's illness, I would never have let her back into the house. But there were benefits to allowing it, including making things a little easier for the girls. As soon as I entered the house, another TV truck pulled up outside and a young woman got out and screamed at me, asking if Linda was home and if I had forgiven her. I smiled, waved at her, and warned her not to enter the territory. I went inside. Linda baked some cookies and offered me one, which I took. There's a TV truck outside. They don't know you're here and maybe they shouldn't know. What do they want? They already published my name and what I did at his house. Can they do any more harm? I'm unsure they can come up with something. I looked at her. I was wondering what to do with you or us. I'd like you to write down for me exactly what happened last Friday from the moment that idiot walked up to us until you ended up in the hospital. Hospital? This doesn't have to happen right now, but it should happen quickly if possible. 
If it's too traumatic, skip the part and write later. I will try. I also need to call and see if I still have a job. Why would they fire you for cheating on me? Why should they care? Well, I was gone for a whole week. She called and was told she could take a week off sick and the next week off. She went to her bedroom and sat at her desk typing on her computer. I left her alone and went to my office where I began to study the autopsy materials. I made sure I would get the test results, but probably not for a few days. Linda was trying to act normal around me. That much was clear. But I thought she must have some questions about what happened. Our routine life continued for two days until I received the test results. Linda's DNA and fluids have been identified, so she probably lied about that night. I waited to see what she would write to me about what happened, but I just couldn't imagine continuing my life with her as my wife. The next day after dinner, Linda walked into my home office. I finished writing here. She handed me the printout. I read what she wrote. Tom, forgive me for my weakness. When Mark asked me to dance, I was so excited. He was charming and had such a reputation. When we danced, I really didn't think about anything else. When the slow dance began, I was simply at his mercy. He pulled me towards him. Honestly, I would have given myself to him right there. I don't know why he was so attractive to me, but he was. He told me to sneak out the side door and we would go to his house. He said I'll have the best intimate experience in my life. I believed him. When the dance ended, I returned to our table and you were not there. I agreed to go to the women's room with June. When you returned, I saw that you were very angry, but I thought you'd get over it eventually and I wanted Mark so badly. We had in him. As we were finishing, the car alarm went off. He put on his robe and went out. He told me to wait there. I looked out the window but didn't see anything. Over the porch roof, I saw someone running away dressed in black. The man jumped over the fence. I found a robe and went down to the front door. He was lying in the driveway. I ran up to him. His head was smashed. I was, well, I was in some kind of trance, just stunned and shocked. I felt guilty, as if it were my fault that I had sinned. The police arrived and I remember being in the hospital. I'm so sorry about all of this. I love you and I don't know why I did what I did. Linda, I looked up at her, tears were streaming down her face. Tom, were you the man I saw? I was here all night, drinking, regretting the end of my marriage and the changes that had to happen in my family. There was hatred in me, but of course, the police told you I was here. They have surveillance footage. That's what they said when I asked, but no buts. I can tell you that I think Stevens got what he deserved. No, Tom, he didn't deserve this. He was nice and he turned your world upside down, right, Tom? Don't, why not? I want you to know that I will never be able to love you the same way again. Maybe I won't be able to love you at all. The man I thought I married would never do what you did. Was it worth it? Was the intimate worth what you lost? What has he lost, you know? The night was really impressive, but it wasn't worth what happened. If we had just had that night and I came home the next day well, maybe. But he's dead, and I'm screwed forever. Yes, you killed him, she turned and ran out of the room. No, you killed him, I muttered. After that, our relationship became cold. I decided not to try to convince her of my innocence or try to make amends in any way. Of course, I would never admit to her what happened. I assumed that if I did, she would immediately tell the cops. She was a woman who could not be trusted at all. She just told me that if Stevens hadn't been killed, her night would have been worth the consequences, maybe not in such terms, but still. A few weeks later, I filed for divorce. I asked for custody of the children so they could stay in the house. Linda still had a job, so I didn't ask for alimony, 
child support, or free visitation. Linda recovered enough that I insisted she move out. She went to visit her parents. I served her there. Soon after, her father called. He wanted me to take the papers, and Linda was desperate. I told him she deserved to be desperate and should get a lawyer. He was very angry, but I didn't know if he was angry with me or her. He asked about visits, and I told him she could come any night and stay until the kids went to bed. Linda showed up the next day at five. I made some macaroni and cheese, and we ate with the girls. We played a few board games with them and put them to bed. After that, Linda wanted to talk, but I was not in the mood. We need to figure this out, Tom. It won't do the girls any good if we're apart. They will have to adapt. You can find a place where they can come to you. The sooner we resolve the divorce, the sooner you can set up a visitation schedule. Please, I don't want a divorce. I made a mistake, okay? It's a big mistake, but I love you. There's no way we're going to stay married after you openly had an affair behind my back. Forget about it and move on, Linda began to cry. Don't sob, just cry quietly. I really felt sorry for her, but not enough to change my mind. We're finished. The divorce took place. We worked out a joint custody agreement, and Linda got an apartment with a large second bedroom for the girls. The two of us established a distantly friendly relationship, focusing on the girls. About four months later, I started dating women from our circle and from work. They knew I was single and seemed to be interested. When Linda had the girls, I brought several women home for the night. However, none of them lasted too long, but the intimacy was usually good and sometimes great. I stayed away from married women, although some seemed eager to sleep with me. But after my experience, I decided it was immoral. Linda was good with the girls, but struggled on her own. She took antidepressants and slept a lot, but managed to go to work and complete her assignments. Her parents and the girls told me she was not dating. After ten years, Shelley left for college, and Laura was about to start her freshman year. The two of them had gotten used to the joint custody arrangement and seemed to be doing well. They both dated in high school and Laura. I believe in college, I was in a long-term relationship with a young woman, Cody, whom I met one night at a bar. Like me, she was divorced, she had two children at home, and her husband had moved to the West Coast. She was 35 when we met, and her children were in school, twins in their second year. When they left for college, she moved into my home. I used to love her, she was funny and smart, and the intimacy was great. She may not have been as beautiful as Linda, but she was pretty, and guys really took notice of her when we were dating. Shortly after we met, I told her about all the fuss surrounding Mark Stevens' death. Of course, I never told her how he died. The uproar eventually died down, and no one was ever arrested or charged. One Saturday, Detective Logan showed up at my house, and I invited him in. I was home alone. I retired last week, a good pension, he said. I'm happy for you, but why are you here? I just want you to know that I was convinced that you killed that idiot, and, well, he deserved it, although maybe not your wife. I didn't do it, but he certainly deserved it. I congratulate whoever did it. Why do you say Linda didn't deserve it? Last night, she responded to an advance from that fool like many other married women do. If they had met in private for an affair, we might have been able to move past it, but it was too bold and showy, you know? How's your partner doing? She's a captain now, quite a spirited woman, he remarked, perceptive. We shook hands, and he departed. Meanwhile, Linda managed to partially recover. We often drove together when I took Shelley to school. One day on the way back, I asked her, How are things, Linda? I'm okay. I have a boyfriend, more like friends with benefits. I know about you and Cody. Well, yes, generally speaking. And once her kids move out, 
We might even live together, Linda whispered. I wish none of this had happened. We'd be empty nesters by now, enjoying ourselves. I still feel really sorry about it. Me too, we both cried. She eventually moved into her friend's apartment, but I don't think she ever fully recovered from that night. Maybe like me. I've never regretted it. It probably saved many marriages. One of my most effective acts of kindness. Thank you to everyone who took the time to hear today's stories. If you enjoyed them, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.